Welcome to the Table Leadership Podcast, where everyone is invited to pull up a seat and all leaders have a voice to contribute to the conversation. We're glad you could join us today. And now, your host, Sion Edgerton. Man, I tell you what, those crepes, those were banging. Like, I oh, wanted to come back good. to Seattle I know. just for that reason. I know. The kids keep talking about that too. They're like, oh, mom, it was so cool. And we were on an island on a ferry. Like, I know they got such a kick out of coming That's to so see cool. you that day. It was so cool for them. So, okay. Well, I know that your time is super valuable. So let's kick this thing off. Um, welcome everybody to the table. I am here with my good, good friend, Danielle who I had hoped to record live with a couple weeks ago when I was in Seattle, but you know, technology is what it is. And so here we are today. Um, where are you? You're in, what's the name of that cafe again? I'm in Chocmo. It's Chocmo. Uh, yeah, there it's a chocolatier. Like, so they specialize in chocolates and desserts and then they added like beer and wine and sa- sweet and savory things too. So yeah. So if anybody is ever in the Bainbridge Island area of Seattle, Washington, I highly, highly, highly recommend it. Cause I was there recently and Danielle took me out for crepes. And aside from France, it was by far the best crepe I've ever had in the States. So, Oh, they're legit. Yeah. It was, yeah. it was really good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyone ever wants to go visit Danielle, uh, that's where you have to go is Chocmo. So, um, for everybody that does not know you, you just introduce yourself. You and I have known each other um, just over a year now through the Azer Collective, but gosh, and we'll talk more about that later, but what an awesome, um, just what a great friendship has really formed out of that. And, and you've spoken into my life in a number of ways. And so just for those who don't have the honor of knowing you, just tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from, what you do, all that good stuff. Yeah, um, I am located in the Pacific Northwest. I'm in Washington and uh, it is like, casual dress all the time. And when you're at the grocery store, you can definitely almost always wear your PJs. Yes. So that's like fun fact about the Northwest. Walmart's another category in itself, but you know, <laughs> uh, so I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I have four children, a 14 year old boy, a 12 year old girl, 10 year old girl, eight year old boy. Um, I'm married to my husband, Luis Castillejo, whose birthday is coming up. He's going to be 40 and I am 41. So it's a little bit about us. We've been married 17 years and we've ridden the roller coaster of super highs and super lows. And we're kind of in a groove right now, um, reimagining communication with each other. And yeah, it's been exciting and hard. And yeah, we're just getting used to, I'm in grad school full time. And I graduate in June, so Luis and I are getting used to rhythms of marriage. So yeah. it's been good. Yeah. And are you doing anything big for Luis's 40th? You know, we might go bowling. It's like a rock and rock and bowl or something. Uh-huh. He doesn't ever go bowling, and he's like, I want to go bowling. So I've been talking to a few friends, and it sounds like a bunch of us are going to dress up in 70s attire. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love it. That's so great. That's mm-hmm. so and I'll, great. I'll probably oh, okay. make him a big chocolate sh- uh, chocolate cake. Yes. So, yeah. Nice. I want to um, I want to see pictures of the 70s attire when this happens. Yeah, awesome. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and you uh, you started a podcast recently too, which I had the honor of being on. Tell us a little bit about the podcast that you and Maggie. Yeah. Had. It's called The Arise Podcast and we talk about faith, race, gender, the church and justice and how that's kind of playing out in our local world as an example, but we know it's playing out all over the country and all over the world, really. And uh, basically I do it with my co-host, with my friend Maggie. And I started it because I had this dream that, okay, I'm doing something. I'm in grad school. I want to use my voice and I want others to have a chance to use their voices And I thought, well, how am I going to do that? I need to start something. I said, let's do it. Maggie's like, are you serious? I'm like, I'm dead serious. I went out and applied for a grant for some podcast equipment. It came through. I bought it. And here we are. That's awesome. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to have you. Well, we'll come back to that. No, we won't. We're just going to talk about that real quick. Talk to me about this whole applying for the grant for your podcast equipment thing. Because um, in some of our conversations, you have just really 
been completely unashamed and unapologetic about, you know what, God's going to, if God wants me to do this thing, God's going to provide. And you have gotten so creative about the way that you resource things. And so just talk a little bit about the whole, Hey, I want to do this thing. And it's going to require a financial investment that maybe I don't have. And so here's all the creative ways that I've gone about it. Cause I think somebody needs to hear that. Yeah. So a lot of times I want to start something or I have a dream and I don't know if it's going to work out. And many of those things that I've wanted to do, like schooling or extra training, they cost money. And I pray about it and I think about it. And usually sometimes there's a low investment, like a $50 fee. And I'll tell my husband, hey, I really want to spend 50 bucks and we don't always have a lot of cash for one income. So I'll put the money down and I'll pray and I'll just, I've been asking God. And sometimes it's an idea like, hey, there's a business in your community, maybe you can offer them a trade. You can teach them a class and they'd be willing to sponsor a certain amount of money for you to do something. Or I go to a friend that I know might have more resources and say, I'm looking for resources for this. Do you know anybody you can connect me with? And another, and so that's kind of how I got the podcast equipment. I mentioned the need. My friend said, this local group sponsors uh, women that are leading in our area here's the application. She said, would you have coffee with me? I'll do a preliminary interview and even see if we're interested. And so not only did they help me with podcast equipment, but they've also contributed to my tuition for next semester. That's so, yeah, I have followed, I've continued to say yes, where it feels right. And in the yeses, sometimes it turns into something and sometimes it's uh, a financial something and other times it's been relationships and other times it's absolutely zero. Yeah. I followed it and it hasn't worked out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and every single point along the way, I just love that it continues to be, okay, God, are you in this? And if so, okay, I'm going to go and see what happens. But ultimately at the end of the day, you know, I love what it always comes back to. And we've had this conversation is, is you're grounded in your identity and you know who you are. And so regardless of what happens and how things play out, you know, at the end of the day, you still know who you are as a woman of God, as a child of God, the, it doesn't affect your identity. And so the freedom that that gives you to be able to get creative, and explore opportunities and to just say yes to things. I think that's, I love it. It's awesome. And and I think that's important for people to hear. You know, sometimes we get really creative about resourcing the thing and taking advantage of opportunities that we feel like God is calling us to. Yeah. And sometimes I've even said, hey, Luis, what do you think about this idea? And he said, yeah, I like it. I'm like, would you be willing to make a trade with someone? Uh, Cause he's a carpenter. And sometimes he said, yeah, I would. I believe in that. Or I've prayed about it and I would. And other times he said, that just feels too stressful. So we just back off. Yeah. So it's kind of like a give and take. And sometimes it hurts when he says no, or it doesn't work out. It, it hurts. And other times I'm okay with it. But all those opportunities, you know, they kind of build a resilience inside mm-hmm. to try again. Yeah. That's so good. And I think that's what so many leaders, new leaders, young leaders, old leaders, we just, we all need to be reminded that, um, just of everything you just said. That's so good. So thank you. Anyway, of course I have you do an introduction and now I'm off in left field, which I have a tendency (laughs) to do. I will warn you. Um, I think it's okay. (laughs) Cause I end up spending most of my time in left field. Um, and so one of the questions that I wanted to start with, just, I ask everybody this because it is the table leadership and I am super passionate about two things, leadership development and food. Um, and so I always ask everybody if we were gathered together live, not virtually, and we were gathered around a table and we had a whole bunch of leaders and we were going to pour into them and invest in them and develop them. What would you be feeding us aside from the amazing crepes and chocolates from Chocmo that you introduced me to? and I now daily crave, what would you put on the table? I'd make a big pot. I'd uh, pressure cook some beans, some pinto beans. And then I would put half of those in a pan and I would make homemade refried beans and I'd have whole pinto beans. Then I'd have a big pot of uh, rice I make with chicken broth and uh, boiled eggs inside of it in the shell. And then I would have crab enchiladas And I would also make chicken and beef tacos and I'd make homemade salsa and have cilantro and onions. So that's what we'd have for dinner. And then for dessert, I'd probably make pie. 
Nice. That was like a full five courses. I guess some people are like, um, you know, we'd have pizza, but you've got like, you've got dessert and this whole meal. I love it. I love it. Crab enchiladas though. I'll have to admit that is a new one for me. Oh, I, they are so good. The first time I tried them, I was worried. And then I tried them and they're like, crab is so expensive. I can rarely make them. But if I have a super special occasion and everybody's okay with seafood, I make it. Nice. Okay. That's a new one that I'll have to try. That sounds amazing. And of course, I mean, you know, tacos are my love language. So yeah, I really, I really want to sit at your table. That sounds great. <laughs> uh, I love your, your homemade refried beans and salsa too. All of it from scratch. Like that's legit. That's good. Yeah. Stuff. Come over. Awesome. Yeah. I'm <laughs> the kids, they had such a blast on that trip on that road trip that we took and they keep asking, what are we going to go to Seattle again? And I was like, yeah, yeah. that have to happen. Cause yeah. we, we've got some connections there. That was an amazing trip. Cool. Okay. So now that we know what you would feed our bodies, um, let's get to the real meat of everything. What is it that you bring to the leadership table? Oh, that's like a daunting question. And it's, yeah. I think in the past, I would have almost said nothing because Mm. it's not that I didn't know myself. I would be afraid to say because I would be afraid like people think you're too confident or Uh you're overstepping your bounds. But now that I know myself more, I realize that that question is actually a kindness. I can offer kindness to myself. Mm. So I think I can provide a lot of hilarity and (laughs) lightness to conversations and that I think I back that up with a lot of depth um, mm-hmm. of experience across like my life and then professionally and studies. And I bring to the table a lot of experiences failing mm-hmm. at different things I've tried and also trying again. So like in the broader picture of such a large question, the, those are the things that come to mind like on a bigger scale. That's so good. And what does it take in order to fail successfully? <laughs> um, it's an inner war. I call this thing, it's, we have these things inside of us. I call it like shame survival skills. Uh-huh. So a lot of times when we grow up for, you know, may, I don't know what everybody's family's like, but varying families, like from a family where, you know, relatively low amount of harm to a family where, you know, people were abused or whatever happened. Mm -hmm. But a lot of our coping mechanisms are connected to shame. Yeah. And those shame strategies, when you're a kid, they help you survive. So I call them like shame survival. So I think um, when you're finding out how to lead well and how to fail well, you really have to wrestle with those skills that you've used in the past to survive that actually served you well. And you have to kind of tell that younger self inside of you, like, that was great. That worked then. And I'm so grateful you could do that. But now let's try a different way. So in order to fail successfully, or that's what we're calling it, you have to be able to deal with the impulse to react shamefully Mm. when something doesn't work out. And, And often things don't work out either. Sometimes it's my fault. Sometimes it's totally out of my control. And sometimes it's a combination of me and someone else because relationships are messy. Yeah. So yeah, kind of having a, uh, having a journey towards knowing what your shame survival skills are. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to, you can like acknowledge them and then hopefully make other choices. Yeah, that's so good. And and I love, so one of the things that that, you know, brings up for me, one of the conversations that I wanted to have with you, you know, we're doing this whole self-care series, looking at four um, categories of self-care, mental, emotional, spiritual, and physical. Because as leaders, you know, it's really easy to focus on everything externally, to focus on the vision, to focus on the organization, on the team, on, you know, the dreams and all of these other things. But, you know, as Joe Saxton so often says that we lead from the inside out. And so when we are not taking the time to steward ourselves well, that's going to impact and affect all of our leadership. And so I I really felt really strongly about doing this series on self-care. And so the aspect that I wanted to have you speak to a little bit was emotional self-care. I will never forget 
when we met at Azar and just, you know, loved hearing your story, which hopefully you can share a little bit with us. Um, and then at dinner that one night where we ended up sitting next to each other and having a conversation and I was in the middle of, uh, uh, a personal situation at that time that I was just, you know, I was there and I was, I was playing my role at Azer, but this was a big heavy thing that I was processing through. And for whatever reason, you just, you really felt like a safe person. And so I began sharing with you about, you know, what was going on and about my journey and everything. And I'll never forget the conversation that we had about trauma. And I had never, you know, considered um, shame or, or trauma or anything like that, something that I had personally dealt with. Um, because in my mind, that's that's big stuff, right? I was never the victim of abuse or anything like that. And so I can't I can't say that I, you know, maybe I've had some hard experiences, but not trauma. But you were explaining the difference between big T and little T, uppercase and lowercase T trauma and how maybe not everyone has experienced big T trauma, but a lot of us have experienced little T trauma and that we have to acknowledge and recognize that so that we can heal from it because there's very specific ways that trauma impacts us emotionally and impacts our bodies, impacts our minds. And that healing from that, and especially the shame associated with that is a process that we need to intentionally engage with. And I think sometimes we have uh, the tendency to, to stuff things down and say, you know what, if I can just kind of stuff it down and power through, then everything will eventually be okay. But it does end up re rearing its head again. And so can you share just a little bit of your story and just your experience with trauma? And then I'd love for us to talk through that healing process and, and coping mechanisms a little bit so that all of us as leaders can really um, lean into our emotional self-care a little bit more. Yeah, I remember um, when Obama was reelected that I was in the middle of contemplating going to therapy. And I knew I was depressed. I knew I was struggling. I had my fourth baby about a year ago, a year prior to that in 2011. And I went to the doctor, got some antidepressants and was trying that out. And it was the wrong match for me. So that antidepressant actually wasn't matching well for what I was experiencing. So I plummeted. So I went from feeling depressed actually taking the medication and not being able to get out of bed. Yeah. So I called the doctor and said, Hey, this isn't working. And he didn't give me really good instructions. And so I pretty much quit at cold Turkey. Mm. I'd never taken any antidepressants before. And he prescribed me Xanax. <clears throat> and so he said, now don't drink alcohol with this. And I didn't, I don't really drink much. I have it my whole life. Um, Prior to that, I didn't really drink much, but something about that was a temptation from the enemy. And I, the combination of that and then having a lot of memories of childhood sexual abuse and, and then the access to the medication, I did. I took a few Xanax, bought myself some alcohol, drank it, and ended up in the hospital mm. just like that overnight. So I got into therapy and started exploring things, signed a contract that said, I will never drink alcohol. And if I do, you can terminate therapy with me. Mm. Um, never do that with a therapist if you're struggling. Yeah. That, will, that will not work. That strategy did not work for me. So I went in about two years later and said, hey, I had some alcohol. She said, you're fired. I, was, I was, didn't have a therapist. Wow. And, uh, and just... I, I, I have an upcoming blog coming out about this, uh, talking about the experience of scrolling through my contacts and experiencing like a really deep depression and despair and hopelessness and not finding anybody to call or reach out to mm. just out of a hundred percent shame. Yeah. And I found this therapist who's, who I still am in contact with. And I went and saw her and I took her all my file. I took all of it to her, set it down on the table and she's, and she didn't look at it. I was like, what? I basically said to her straight up, what's wrong with you? This is what's going on with me for the last two years. Can you take a look at it? And she said to me, I don't need to read that. I will get enough about you from sitting with you. Mm -hmm. And I think for the first time in my life, I knew she didn't know me well but she knew me well enough that she trusted her experience and trusted her experience of me 
And that enabled me to return to therapy. And so it was about two years into therapy that she, my son was finally in kindergarten. I stopped taking antidepressants. I wasn't drinking. And and this is from a a healing therapeutic relationship. It doesn't work like this for everybody, but this is my process. She handed me a book and she said, Hey, you don't read. Why don't you read? Here's, here's a really good book. I got the book and took it home. I read it in one day. Hmm. And I called her on the phone and I said, I read, excuse me, I read your book. Thank you so much for the book. And I just started weeping because she saw something in me and she believed it and she believed in me and, and she believed that I could read. So from that moment on, I started reading avidly. Um, and then the next year I applied to go to graduate school and I'm finishing up that three pro- three year process right now. So I have this journey that's taken me through some low valleys, right? Yeah. To where I am now. And what I think about when I think about emotional health is that I don't beat myself up for not going to therapy or engaging the issues of my childhood before then, because I do believe at some point the valleys that I've passed through are enabling me to pursue my calling now. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that if someone would have came into my life or I would have had some more awareness or heard something like this, that I maybe could have reached out for help or told my story to someone that could have said, Hey, Danielle, I'm going to sit with you for a minute. I'm not going to make you sign a contract. I'm just going to listen. And so I think part of our emotional health is, um, I was just talking to a friend of mine is actually taking a pause a time out and listening to my body now listening to my mind and not beating myself up if I still feel activated from memories or activated from situations or relationships. But if I can just take even a time out and I don't mean like a whole day, that could mean five minutes. Yeah. Or maybe I turn on a music that matches my mood. That's something I do right now. I'll flip through my music library and find music that matches my mood. And so it depends on my mood, what music I play. And that kind of helps me process emotion. So I think, I think the first thing I would ask, I ask of myself and my kids and my husband and my friends is, hey, let's just take a second to think, a pause. Let's, let's listen in. Let's check in with our bodies. And I, I know I'm monologuing a long time right now, but just the thought of in our culture, Everybody's saying self-care, 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 self-care. And then they're also saying, if you have pain, don't stop. Keep going. Mm. Because if you don't get it, someone else will. If you don't get your money, you're not going to get it. You're not going to survive. So we have two really different messages coming at us. Or you need to do X, Y, and Z for self-care. And that costs so much money. So how are you going to afford that? When maybe we just need to start with a timeout. Yeah. So... Yeah, I kind of went off there a little bit, but that's kind of where I'm coming from. Well, I think the first few times you try it, or maybe many times or off and on, it's going to hurt. I don't think it's necessarily going to feel good. So the the fact that like the first time you try anything, it's hard. Sometimes I think it's hard for people to keep doing it. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our culture, right? Mm -hmm. We want to be able to say, oh, take a pause. Hmm. Oh, yeah, I notice a pain in my right arm. Yeah, that's not how it's going to work. I think we're going to take a pause and then we're going to say to ourselves, why are my thoughts still racing? 
Mm. Why is my heart beating fast? Or I can't, or we might argue with ourselves. Why am I arguing with myself? I want to calm myself. So I think one thing you can do in addition to pausing is to calm your parasympathetic nervous system, like your the regulation in your body, the, the regulators. And so you could breathe in for five counts and breathe out for five counts. And um, I love my kids. They learn some breath work at school. And one thing one of my sons does is he takes a rainbow breath. So this is something you could do in your home or in your car. Basically, you sit there or you stand. And when you breathe in, you get your hand, you wave your hands up into the air. And then you breathe out, you bring your hands back down together at the same time. Hmm. And sometimes he also does like a bear breath where he kind of like growls in and growls out or um, a bunny breath where he kind of does like shorter breaths. And these are things I learned from my eight-year-old son (laughs) and I've tried them and they actually help calm me down. They're funny sometimes, but I think the process of moving our body and then allowing breathing to happen and paying attention to our breathing, that helps us slow down our minds. Mm-hmm. And so what, it, when something comes up, talk to me a little bit about what, when you talk about little T trauma, what are some of the things that we may have experienced um, that can hang around and can still be affecting us even physiologically? I remember the one conversation that you and I had over dinner that one night, and you talked about how the uh, ongoing effects of the trauma and the stress can affect us not just emotionally and mentally, but but even physiologically. How does trauma tend to hang on to us? Yeah. So when we're young, or a lot of it has to do with attachment, right? Okay. A, a baby needs to have a caregiver, a sense of safety, a sense of someone sees the baby, a sense of love. They need to be fed. They need to be held. They need to feel warm. And and that process as a baby is really important to being able to stay in their bodies as adults, as teenagers, and be more resilient. So I think a lot of trauma for a lot of people happens in tiny ways Maybe we had, you know, semi-present parents, but they weren't able to, you know, form bonds with us. And so we find ourselves kind of loose in the world. Or maybe the bonds our parents formed with us were actually really gripping and really constraining and really harming. And so then we learn to operate in those bonds. And then when we're outside of our family system, we're still operating very much like we're still in our family system. So I think trauma keeps reenacting itself because unless you deal with it, it will keep repeating because the brain learns a pattern and it's smart. It says, I don't need to relearn this unless we stop and slow down. It just keeps reacting the same way. It's learned to do something. So does that help a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think think I'm trying to answer your question. I don't, I hope I'm getting there. No, you totally are. And I think too, um, you know, what I hear or I see a lot and what I have personally experienced a lot is feeling like, you know what? I know better. I should just be able to deal with this and get past it because my adult self, like, I I somehow intellectually know that, oh, well, that's not right, or that wasn't okay, or I should, the amount that I should on myself, right? I should be able to power through. Intellectually, I'm an intelligent enough person and educated enough that I know better, so why can't I get past this thing? Why does it keep affecting me? Why don't I feel better? And, And I know that it's because I haven't engaged with this stuff, or I hadn't until I got into therapy and whatnot, but why is it not just an intellectual fix? Because we're not made just of intellect. Mm. We're not just a walking brain. We're a mind. It's an embodied mind. It's cells in your hand that have a memory of how to hold a cup that your brain doesn't tell to do that. It's 
um, getting stung by a bee when you're a child and that feeling of getting stung by a bee. So when you see a bee is when you're older, you're going to be wary. It's your body is always learning. It's because you are so intelligent that you keep repeating the patterns, even though you might cognitively be able to tell yourself, stop doing that. Your, your brain and your mind are so intelligent. They're saying, no, we need you to actually listen to the deeper message here that your body and your, your mind is telling you. So I don't know if you knew this, but you have like your second brain in your gut. So when you get a gut feeling, you actually have neurons in your gut that are feeding that feeling of intuition. Hmm. And, and so when you have those senses, you have more than just what's right up front. You have what's going on in your gut. And, and all these things are pointing towards, they create patterns and ways of being in the world. And so if you just try to intellectualize yourself out of it, it's like you have to cut off part of your body. Hmm. Man, that whole idea, you know, you're talking about the bee sting and, and the coffee cup and all of that. Just the idea of trauma being stored at a cellular level. It's not just you know, this abstract memory of this experience that I had, but the fact that it actually gets stored at a cellular level. How does that even how does that even work? I think that's what blows my mind is that some of my experiences are being stored at a cellular level. And so therefore healing and growth from those things requires me actively engaging with it. Mm -hmm. I think two things happen when you have somatic memories or feelings of touch or taste or feel Mm -hmm. in your body, you have to give those things. uh, Well, you don't have to, but one way is to engage in art or music or play and you can co-create that in a space with your family or your therapist or, or other leaders. Engage those things somatically, but I think it helps to name those things out loud too. You might not remember getting, for instance, someone who's been physically abused, they might not remember all the beatings. Mm-hmm. Man, they may have pain somewhere in their body. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and so maybe maybe they need to begin work towards naming some of those feelings Mm -hmm. and offering when the pain comes up, offering that part of their body kindness Mm -hmm. and part of offering it kindness is not ignoring it. If you just ignore the pain and move on or you do things that further harm that part of your body that's already hurting, then you're reinforcing the message. So Mm -hmm. Not e- it's not easy work. Will you talk a little bit more about that idea, the fact that just because we feel something physically, it may not necessarily always be a physical, I mean, it's a physical manifestation, but it can be a physical manifestation of an emotional pain is what you're saying? Mm-hmm. Or okay. like a, it could be a memory, mm-hmm. like the cells remember and as they remember, that part of your body might hurt. Yeah, that blows my mind. Because I think the, again, the logical side of me wants to say, if I don't even have a memory, and this and this is, this is relevant, and I totally am in, in agreement with you because um, when I engaged in my own season of intense therapy, uh, which I used to be completely opposed to, and I had to get through, I had to walk through a process just to be okay going to therapy and feeling like, gosh, this doesn't mean that, I'm a wreck or a mess or a failure or don't have enough faith or, or anything like that. You know, that God has given this person a gift and I'm going to engage with their gift. Um, but I remember that was one of the things that I said to her as she was kind of helping me to circle back around to some of the things that were still affecting me was it doesn't make any sense. If I don't consciously have a memory of this, how on earth is it affecting me? And the answer yeah. to that is what you were just saying, because it's stored at a cellular level, right? Can you talk about that a little bit? Like just because I don't have a conscious memory of something. Yeah. Just because you don't have a conscious memory of something doesn't mean that your body is not remembering it. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way of your body making it conscious is for you to have pain or a symptom or something else. 
Yeah. And this, I know we talk so much about our childhoods and about things that happened when we were younger. Um, but we really, this could be adult experiences Mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Like what what are some examples of things that we may experience as adults that end up kind of continuing to affect us or being stored, you know, little T traumas that are continuing to affect us that we might need to engage with. Yeah, like car accidents or you break a bone in your body. It was an accident. Maybe when you saw a car accident or you saw someone fall and break a bone or you saw someone slip on ice and just fall and bruise themselves or someone crash on a bike. The next time you're on a bike and you're in that same area, you might flinch. Mm -hmm. So you're you're remembering, you know? Yeah, our brains are engaging in in even Mm -hmm. the tiniest ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what are, if you could give options, right? So for a leader who says, you know what, I really want to engage with myself, with my body, with the things that might even be happening, you know, underneath my conscious self. And and I want to engage because I want to be made whole and, you know, to start the healing process. What are some of the different ways we can do that? Because I know, and you even mentioned, you know, you had one not great experience with one particular therapist. You had a not great experience with medication. You finally found the path that worked for you. So are there different paths that we might take to engage with and heal from some of these things? And can you give some examples of what some of those different paths might be? Yeah, you could try yoga therapy. Mm -hmm. Um, You could try CrossFit. Um, You could try walking. You could try laying in your bed, breathing. You could take a you could offer kindness to your body, maybe a warm bath with Epsom salts. Um, you could ask for recommendations for a therapist and reach out for those recommendations. And don't be afraid. I didn't do this. I didn't know about this, but I could have interviewed that therapist before I started hmm. and not, and I didn't have to just accept everything she said. Yeah. I could have had, you know, someone else help me pick her mm-hmm. or help me discern a little bit about what I might need. So kind of involving your community. You could talk with a friend. You could talk with another leader. Those are you know, a lot of different ideas. So it's not just, I need to find a counselor. I need to go to therapy. I mean, I think it's so interesting that you said even just, hey, go go for a walk, take some time to have some healing breaths and be kind to yourself. It really can be as simple as that. Mm-hmm to get started and you can, you'll know, you can trust learning to trust your gut and your community and, and deciding when you need different kinds of help. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think the first thing that comes to my mind, because I know that I've been in seasons and even now this is always my struggle is gosh, when in my leadership life, do I have time to take a walk? Or do I have time to, you know, take a bath? Or do I have time to engage in in therapy? You know what? I should just be able to pray this away. And here's, if, if you had talked to me a few years ago, and if we had been having this conversation, that's exactly what I would have I'm going to ask you as a professional person, because this is what you're going to school for. This is what you're actually called to do with your life. If we had had this conversation a few years ago, how would you have responded to me when I said to you, I don't have a lot of time for that stuff. I'm doing maybe later in a different season, I'll be able to engage with that. But right now I'm just too busy. Plus I'm just, I'm going to pray and I'm just going to, Trust. And, and here's the, I'm not discrediting that either because I absolutely believe in the power of prayer and I believe in the miraculous instantaneous healing power of uh, the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Um, okay. But in that season, I would have said, um, yeah, I'm just going to pray. Hopefully I have enough faith to be healed because I'm really busy and that's my, that's my self-care right now. Mm-hmm. How might you have encouraged me, and how might you have responded to me at that point? I, w- I think I would have asked. I think I would have been curious for you. What you know, how it w- how it was working for you? Like, how was that going? <laughs> oh, that would that would have crushed me right there because the answer would have been, well, not great because obviously I'm dealing with issues. And I think, like, if you weren't, I would say, well, what what would you be willing to try taking a bath? Would you be willing to try? considering it? Would you be willing to try meeting this person? If you were in my community, 
I would just, I'd be asking questions and be curious with you. And then I'd want to know um, if you're willing to go to a doctor for a broken leg and you mm. would you be willing to see someone when you're feeling that kind of mental, you know, difficulty or, mm. you know, the feeling of stress inside, would you be willing to talk to someone that has studied and pursued that and with the freedom always to say no? Yeah. And that's, you know, that's such a good point too, because I feel like, um, and, and maybe I'm only speaking for myself, but I feel like when there's something physical, we have a tendency to treat it differently than something mental or emotional. Uh, we have a tendency to discredit our mental and emotional pain more than we would a broken leg. Like that's obvious. And yes, it hurts. And I'm going to acknowledge that my broken leg hurts and I'm going to go to the doctor so that it can be properly treated. Mm-hmm. When it's mental and emotional trauma or pain or stress, um, I feel like culturally we have a tendency to somehow just try to push past and, and power through and even invalidate some of the um, treatments that are even available out there. Mm-hmm. It's true. But it's, oh. it's, it's the same. I mean, like, like you just said, if you have a broken leg and you would go to a doctor, why wouldn't you seek some care for the mental and emotional um, pain and trauma that you're feeling. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yep. Um, what are some, if you don't mind me asking, what are some of the things, um, as leaders specifically, because that's, that's really who our audience is, people that are leading in, in a variety of different, different capacities. Um, but what are some of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Indicators, I guess. What are some of the indicators that we might look for um, to know that, hey, I might have something that I need to do? Maybe it's not manifesting in a physical way, but what are some of the, the indicators that we might look for so that we know, hey, you know what? I might need to deal with something internally that has nothing to do with my job or this particular situation. What are some of the like emotional Yeah. I I think something that's a telltale sign for me is when I'm in relationships in different environments um, uh, that I, I might have a reaction with someone Mm -hmm. and be feeling sketchy towards them. And then when I have a moment to think on it myself, I realize, Oh, actually I wasn't mad at them at all. Does that make sense? I might have that, or I might just have a harder time getting out of bed in the morning. Hmm. Or I might just sit in my car a second longer. Yeah. And when someone invites me to do something, I go, but I don't have as much to say. Or maybe I go and I have too much to say. Mm-hmm. And I'm oversharing and I walk away thinking, why did I do that? Hmm. What am I looking for? So those are, I think, just like kind of some of the extremes that we encounter. Yeah. Like often I think it happens in extremes. Like we want to share, we want to go, we want to do something. And then what happens is... We can't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, good. It sounds like it, self-awareness is really key. Having a good idea of what our our healthy baseline is, so that when we're veering away in one direction or another, we can engage with that. Exactly. Yeah, that's good. Well, the last thing that I'll ask you um, is, what would what are you reading right now, and what might you recommend for someone who is saying, "Gosh, this is really resonating with me," and I want to engage further with this conversation regarding trauma and healing and just my own emotional self care. What might you recommend, um, and then what are you yourself reading right now? Yeah, so for engaging in trauma and self care, I think the body keeps the score okay. by Bessel van der Kolk. The body keeps the score. It talks about everything we just talked about with more details. And really, it's for people that are studying psychology and it's for people that are not studying it, okay. that are curious about their own bodies and about their own awareness. And then what I, what am I reading personally? Mm-hmm. Oh, what am I reading? I got, I'm reading this book called A Theology of Hopelessness <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> by Miguel de la Torre. And so uh, he talked about Uh Afro-pessimism and uh, just this idea that we always feel like we have to get out of hopelessness. Mm. And so I was interested. So I bought his book and I'm reading that. Yeah. 
Okay. I know it's kind of odd. No, I think that's great. Awesome. Well, we're going to include links to both of those in the show notes. So anybody that wants to grab them can do so. Um, but this has just been super enlightening. Thank you for sharing your story and your time with us. We appreciate it. And uh, what an encouragement it has been for us to really just continue to grow our self-awareness and, and our care and being kind to ourselves. I love the language that you use about being kind to yourself. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to the Table Leadership Podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to the resources that were discussed at the table today and to connect with today's guest. Remember to subscribe to the Table Podcast and follow along on social media at the Table Leadership. Visit thetableleadership.com to learn more about current courses and coaching opportunities. And finally, you can connect with me, your host, at cionedgerton.com or on social media at cionedgerton. I look forward to the next time that you pull up a seat at the table.